Hey everyone, and welcome to my full in-depth guide to Azir. In case you're new to the channel, I'm a multi-rank 1 challenger mid laner, and I also played pro play for 4.5 years. Azir with the rework has been changed pretty significantly, so in this video I'll make sure to get you up to date on that. All the different sections will be timestamped in the description below, so make sure to check that out. Starting out, let's talk about Azir's identity. So Azir's identity, to me, is really interesting, because when this champ was first released, he was super broken, and his kit was good at virtually everything. After he was kind of moved into a more normal state, he was still fairly well-rounded, but he was more of a poke mage for the longest time, and I'd say for the last 3 or 4 years he has been that, but now Azir is back to being a DPS mage, so he's very very good against short range comps or against tanks and stuff that you can DPS a lot. To be honest, he is quite overtuned at the moment, so again he kind of does fill that jack of all trades role of just being good at everything, while also being a master of DPS, so that's really really nice. He does still have a couple weaknesses though, so he is a little bit weak in the early game, and especially in early skirmishes, but I guess your general game plan as Azir, what it's going to look like is normally you play pretty safe pre-6, Sometimes you can abuse your lane a little bit, like if you're versus a melee champ or a weak range champ, you can look to poke them out. But if nothing happens in the first six levels, you're pretty much fine. After that, you can look to start getting more aggressive. You know, you can start to poke, you've got really good gang set up, you start to get a bit better at skirmishes and stuff like that. But really what you're aiming for is to get towards your one item without falling too far behind. A zero one item is a massive spike and you're pretty much ready to go. And once you're two items onwards, especially once you get more attack speed, you're you're really, really strong. So that's going to be your general game plan as a zero and your general identity. Again, is kind of a front to back DPS mage. But of course, you do have some elements of engage and flanking and stuff like that with your ult, which um, obviously has a lot of different uses. But we will talk about that as we go. Azir has several different viable rune pages, but I do think there are a couple that stand above the rest, so I'll go through them all and give my opinions on them. There are also some that correspond with certain builds, so I'll make sure to bring that up as well. So the most common and the two pages that I think are the best on Azir is the Conqueror page and the Lethal Tempo page. And now with both of these, you're going to take the exact same you know, secondaries and everything. So presence of mind, it's obvious the other ones aren't really that good and the mana goes a really long way. Alacrity, of course, for the attack speed, there isn't much else we can take here. You could maybe take Tenacity, but I think getting it from Merc Treads is normally better. And yeah, the, the attack speed's going to go a long way. Down here with Cutdown, again, it's the only one that really does anything. And of course, for your secondaries, Mana Flow Transcendence makes the most sense. The CDR is actually pretty nice later on in the game. And again, having the mana early does go a pretty long way. You you don't use a ton of mana, but you will notice it, I think, if you play without the mana runes. But again, you, you can kind of get away with them, as we'll talk about in the other pages. But I think this page here is going to be your, your standard at least when it comes to the secondaries and shards and everything. Now the first kind of distinction we need to make is between Conqueror and Lethal Tempo. So the thing is that Conqueror scales better, there's no doubt about that, especially once you have existing attack speed or once you have Rabadons, the extra ability power is going to go a really long way. But the thing with Conqueror is that it's very weak early game. So for a lot of early game skirmishers, and particularly before you have attack speed, Lethal Tempo is a lot better. The thing I also like about Lethal Tempo is that it allows you to just rush out a Mythic. So as we'll talk about in the item section, it's really common on Azir to go chapter Nashers. And the reason is because if you take something like Conqueror and you don't have Nashers early, you just don't have the attack speed to stack it up. But if you go Lethal Tempo, you have the attack speed, which allows you just to rush out at straight Leandries. So I'm actually more of an enjoyer of Lethal Tempo, especially especially in solo queue, when I think the, the early game is pretty important, like that first 15 minutes before you have chapter Nashers, Lethal Tempo is definitely going to be better than Conqueror. But as I was saying, if you if you want the full scaling, if you do want to kind of play more towards like the 2, 3, and plus item mark, Conqueror is definitely better. So... It's up to you. Well, I guess one other thing is the the attack speed or the sorry the range on this actually does work on the soldiers. It's it's not that much range, but it can be a little bit. So I would recommend taking one of those pages. But let's talk about the couple other ones that we have. So the first one is the airy page. So if you want to play something like Chapter Shadow Flame and you want to be really aggressive early, you can run a page of something like this. You know, with absolute focus and scorch um, or transcendence. Like that'll be fine as well. And then you can mix and match here with what you want, like you can go Prince of Mind and Alacrity is pretty good for scaling if you want to all in on the early game. Something like Resolve or Inspiration, like all of these are fine. Um, I don't like this page that much on Azir, but it does have potential in games that you know are going to be really fast and like, I don't know, you can really bully your lane. But overall, I think it's much better to still play Lethal Tempo if you're going Shadow Flame. So it's an option. But I, I personally wouldn't recommend it. You can also do this with Comet if you're against a Mage Champion as opposed to a Melee. But once again, I prefer the Lethal Tempo. 
So another page that is kind of good is the Hail of Blades page. So for that, you probably want to run something like this and then come back over into Mana Flow. So this is also very good at skirmishing and also very good at laning. So when you do this, you might want to swap out Transcendence for Scorch just so you have a bit more early game power. Um, that'll allow you, I guess, to have both strong skirmishes and strong laning. Again, I don't like this that much. I mean, to be honest, it's fine. Like, there's nothing really wrong with it, but I think Lethal Tempo or Conqueror are better. But if it's something you want to experiment with, be my guest. I've played a couple of games of it, and it did actually feel pretty good, but I do think the other keystones are better. Now quickly, before we move on, I'm going to talk about some of the optimizations you can make. So of course, you know, we're going Conqueror or Lethal Tempo here. These are going to be our, our normal ones, and we're going to go like this. So you might want to change this up sometime. So if you're against a champion that's very strong early, like um, currently Static LeBlanc, Annie, Syndra, those sorts of champs, going second win and unflinching can make your laning phase a lot easier. And it also means that it's not as required to just instantly rush mercs. This makes a big difference versus these champs. And I think it's really important as Azir that you don't fall behind early because you will just scale so well as long as you get to level six without being too far behind. So I think being willing to go this can work. If you're against an assassin as well, you could swap to bone plating and overgrowth if you felt like you need it. I think that can go a long way. Um, obviously back in our transcendence page, you can drop um, you can drop Transcendence for Scorch if you do want more pressure, which works well against melees or like short range champs. Um, but I don't go with that often, again, because I think a lot of the time, like, yeah, you can poke people out as Azir, but it's unlikely you're going to kill them, at least until like level 7 and stuff, in which case your Scorch has already been useless for a long time. So I'm not a huge Scorch Azir enjoyer, but there are some matchups where it's good. And finally, the only other things you might consider is if you're against a mid jungle like Jarvan Fizz, for example, Stopwatch obviously gets a lot of value, especially if you're going to build a Zonyas later on. And also Flash Cooldown is really nice. So you can do these like secondaries, the ones I've been talking about with any of the pages. Um, you know, like you can rush Halo, you can have Halo Blades with this, for example. What I'm trying to say basically is this is going to be your default most of the time, and it's going to be fine in 90% of games. But if you do want to optimize, there are some matchups and some mid jungle combos where you might want to change it, but you can't really go wrong with this. For Azir's starting items, you really only have a couple of choices, which is Corrupting Pot or Doran's Ring 2 Potions. This is the same as pretty much any other AP mid, which is just if you feel like you're not going to take much damage back, then look to start Doran Ring 2 Potions. You can poke out your opponent and you'll have a lot of mana. If you're going to be trading heavily, like if your opponent has a lot of poke or they really need to all in you, basically if it's just going to be a trade where you're going to be fighting, sorry, a lane where you're going to be fighting a lot, then Corrupting Pot is going to be better. And if you're not sure, it's normally safer to go Corrupting Pot because again, all you really need to do as Azir is survive early. If you can do more with Doran's Ring, that's great, but you don't necessarily have to. Early buys, pretty straightforward. You want to go boots pretty early in skill shot lanes because again, the movement speed is really, really nice. Dark Steel, as with any AP champ, is probably the best item in the game. When fully stacked, it's absurd. And Azir, he has good AoE, so you can easily get a lot of stacks, and you also have a lot of safety, especially with your dashes and self peel. So you're not going to be dying that much, but yeah, I mean, Dark Steel is just a broken item. Chapter is your go-to item. If you can buy a chapter first base, you pretty much always should. It's just going to solve all your problems. You're going to have infinite mana, lots of you know AP, ability haste, and whatever. Now, Merc Treads, there are some matchups where you should be rushing Merc Treads first. So if you're against a champ with both skill shots and CC, the movement speed and tenacity goes a really long way. So again, champs like... Um, LeBlanc, Annie, Zoe, Lissandra, like some of those, the skill shots aren't as important and you're just building it for the tenacity. But pretty much against these combos, you really need to make sure you rush Merc Treads early. They also do apply to certain mid jungle combos. So if you were versus, say, I don't know, like Elise plus Lissandra or something like Sedge plus Lissandra, like that would be a really obvious Merc Treads rush game. And it's, we'll talk about it in the sums, but it's pretty hard to take cleanse on Azir, and you're much better off just building it in tenacity, which I would recommend. Now, one other thing I forgot to mention is you can rush a Kindle Gem because there is a crown build on Azir, but personally, I don't like it as much. I think that there's not that many lanes where you need the extra health as a defensive stat, and also think crown is overbought on Azir, but we'll talk about it when we get to the mythics. For the most part, your safety will just come from your range and from your self peel and maybe from mercs. Um, again, you don't really need health so much of this champ, at least that's my opinion. So for our boot options, we have a bunch of different ones. So Sorks is your go-to. Sorks are really, really good on Azir. The magic pen is fantastic and it's going to make you a lot stronger in the early game. 
Merc Treads, they get a lot of value in certain comps. The tenacity, like I mentioned, can go a really long way. The magic resist is not as valuable. You know, you're not getting any more magic resist than you pay for with 450. So you're mainly building it for the tenacity, but if they are heavy on AP, it can be a way to get magic resist early. CDR boots, I would pretty much never build this on us here. I think most of the time you do just want Sorks, but the one exception might be if you really need Flash cooldown. Again, Flash isn't as important on Azir because you do have a lot of mobility and self peel anyway, but you can use, you know, Flash to engage with your ult. Maybe there are certain combos that you have to Flash, you know, otherwise you'll die. So you, you can use it for Flash cooldown if you really need to. And the last one is Berserkers because I know I'm going to get a lot of questions about it. And in my opinion, they're not actually that good on Azir. I think Magic Pen is more value unless maybe you're against a team of literally full tanks. But I think most of the time Magic Pen is just going to be better and you can get your attack speed easier from other sources. So we've got a couple main builds that we'll take a look at. First one, it's very simple. You rush out your Leandries and your tier two boots. After that, you go for Nashes, which is just your strongest second item. And from there, we go to stuff like Rabadons and Void. You know, Rabadons third is pretty much always the highest damage unless they have a lot of MMR, in which case you're probably gonna wanna pick up a Void before that. And then you'll round out the build with the Zonia. So this is kind of your pretty much highest damage build and your, your basic build that doesn't need like that much thinking about. Some adaptations you can make, you can go chapter Nashes. So this is very good with Lethal Tempo, whereas I'd say this is better with Conqueror. So with Conqueror, you rush out the chapter, but then we rush straight towards the Nashers. This will give you the attack speed, which makes stacking up Conqueror a bit easier. And then we'll go for the Mythic later on before finally going for these items. Now, there are some things. So if you guys have kept up with my AP itemization guides, it's, it's difficult, I guess, to to buy a defensive item somewhere like here, you know, because if you go, say, Leandri, Sorks, Nashers, Zonia, sure, you get your defensive, and you can do this, like, it's viable, but you delay your damage items so late in the game, and a lot of time in solo queue, you're just not going to get there, so I don't really like that. I much prefer, if, if you can't, I guess, like, if you need a defensive item really badly, you should either get it from your Mythic, or from your Runes, or your Sums, or failing all that, drop Nashers and just go like Zonia's Rabadons, especially if you have attack speed from Lethal Tempo. Now, again, I don't think this is that viable with Conqueror because you're just not going to have any attack speed, which, again, it's playable, but I don't really like it. So the TLDR is that you normally want to get your defensives from other sources, which is what I'm going to talk about in a moment. And this is going to be your highest damage build. So try get this if you can. Um, coming back to our chapter build here, so with the chapter Nashes, you can also do this with Shadow Flame. So again, this is like more of a Conqueror build, but if you run Shadow Flame, you can go chapter, replace Nashes with Shadow Flame, and then build normally, and that gives you a lot of burst. You probably do want attack speed from somewhere else, like either Hail of Blades or Lethal Tempo or something, but that can work for a, a really strong early game spike. So for alternative mythics, right? We've got the Crown, the Roa, and the Ludens. So in my mind, Ludens is just inferior to Leandri's, and you should pretty much never build it on Azir. So I'm not even going to worry about it too much. I guess the time you might build it is if you're solo AP, there are a bunch of squishies, you just really value the magic pen and the burst, then it can be good. But honestly, Leandri's is so good on Azir that it has to be a really good argument for Ludens. Okay, but our alternative mythics, the crown and the roa. So this is what I mean, where you can get defensive stats, I guess, from somewhere else. So for example, if we were versus a champ like Zed, right, and we really need, we really like need a Zonias at some point, if you don't want to drop, say, Nashes for Zonias, you're much better off going, say, like crown or rod of ages and then you know going for the nashes or something like that but what i will say is that both of these items are such a dps loss compared to leandry's that i try not to do it i guess like if i were a zed what i would do personally is i would probably go i'd probably take exhaust and i would go like leandry's sorks uh zonia's rabadons and i would just get my attack speed from lethal tempo and then i wouldn't pick up the nashes until later in the game but if you're super set on having that Nashers in the build, then you'd probably have to go, again, like Roa Nashers or something like that, or Crown Nashers. The thing with Crown is like, especially, well, yeah, especially with Crown is it's a lot less damage early. And while it does protect you against Burst, it's really easy to just get the shield pop. Like I see a lot of people build this and even if they have like one range champ on their team, like a Barris or something, or even a Static Shiv Zeri, it's going to get popped before fights and that makes it really annoying. So I kind of hate Crown. I'm a Crown hater in general, but it does have some usage. And again, there is like an argument, I suppose, for it that you deal so much damage, even without the Andries, that all you need to do is survive. But I hope this like kind of makes sense. Basically, what I I guess my philosophy when it comes to it is Azir has a lot of safety already. 
So I'm trying to optimize my damage first and then try and fit in what safety I can. So I guess to reiterate, if I really needed a defensive, like a Zonya's or a Banshee, I'd probably go like Leandri's, Sorks, Banshee's, Rabadon's Void, Nashers, um, with Lethal Tempo again, so that I get the attack speed for the early game. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, you know, put a question in the comments below. Situational items, I've talked about a few of them already, but the Magi's here, so if you get a lot of stacks on Dark Seal from early game, you can upgrade to Magi's. Again, Azir is pretty safe, and you're likely to get a lot of stacks. The movement speed's pretty nice, so it is actually a pretty good item on Azir. I think Azir is one of the safest mid laners if you're playing it well. Now, if you intend on engaging a lot, like let's say you're playing against a comp where you really need to kill their AD carry, and you're diving into their team every time, then it doesn't make a lot of sense, because you're probably going to die at some point. So try and factor that in as well. Shadow Flame, I mentioned it before. I think it's only good if you're doing chapter Shadow Flame. I think otherwise Nash's is just going to be better. And again, the time to use it would just be if you really, really want strong early game. So the example I actually did in a Shadow Flame separate video was Lethal Tempo Azir with chapter Shadow Flame and Sorks. That just gives you like a super strong early game. You're going to be really, really OP for that first 15 to 20 minutes, but it does get outscaled pretty hard and it doesn't work, I would say, unless you're the solo AP of the team. So check out the Shadow Flame video if you want more details on that, but I, I wouldn't recommend it that highly on Azir. Next, Oblivion Orb. So Oblivion Orb, it's it's pretty good on Azir. You know, you can apply it to several different targets. The Grievous Wounds can go a long way. Um, you can even upgrade it to Morello if you really need, but just bear in mind that you're competing with some other really good items. Like, are you really going to replace a Nashes with an Oblivion Orb or a Morello? I would say probably not. You know, when it's competing up against Rabadons, again, can you really make that argument? I don't think so, because Rabadons will just deal more damage. I guess if they're really heavy on AP or healing, excuse me. So like a comp I saw on Twitter the other day was like Swain, Soraka, Aatrox. Like that would be pretty good grounds for a Morello or at least an Oblivion Orb. But I think in general, you should try not to build it, but there might be some games where you need it. So Demonic and Rylai, these can be really good late game items if you still don't need a defensive. So let's say in this build here, we get to this point and like, I don't know, maybe we don't need a Void because they have no MR and maybe we don't need a Zonies at all. We could go something like Demonic or Rylai's here. They do work well, uh, but again, they're kind of hard to fit in the build early and it's not often that you're going to get to this point in the build and be like, okay, a Zonies or a Banshees wouldn't go a long way here. So I would recommend grabbing these, you know, in the late game, but you can consider them. And on that note, like Zonies and Banshees, they're your go-to defensive items as i've kind of mentioned a lot of times i think it's much better to go leandry's banshees than it is to go say crown nashers at least that's my opinion especially if you have attack speed from your runes so ap is countered by banshees obviously and ad is countered by zonias now sometimes you counter ap with zonias like fizz for example it's normally better to build zonias against fizz than it is to build banshees but it also depends like what other things are on their team, right? Like if it were a full AP team, you'd, you'd prefer the Banshees for sure. But if it were like, again, I think Fizz Jarvan was the example I used, like that would be a really good Zonya's game. And finally, the Void. So the reason I put Void in situational is because at least in high low, it's pretty much always guaranteed that you need a Void in your build because people are going to build Magic Resist. But from coaching a lot of you guys in lower elos, a lot of people don't build MR. So if you get to four items or three items and you don't need a Void, you don't have to build it. Like if they don't have MR, you can just look to build something else. But most of the time, at least as you get higher elo, you are going to need it in your build at some point. And it's really, really important that you pick up the Void almost like before you need it. Like if you notice they're starting to build MR components, you need to start building it. You don't want to be buying Void or like thinking about buying Void after they've already got completed, you know, Abyssal Mask or something because you're going to deal no damage for a really long time. So I think that's pretty much it for the itemization. Most of it is just similar to other mages. I guess to reiterate, what I think is the best build in Azir is just to do this uh, with, with Lethal Tempo and then to swap in a defensive for Nashers if you really need and do something like that. Um, but yeah, there's also other builds that you can run with Conqueror, like Chapter Nashers, you know, Chapter Shadow Flame. Thumbs on Azir are super straightforward. There's pretty much only a couple you need to know. You're always going to take Flash, of course, for the mobility, but also because of the Flash combos that you can do when you're engaging. It's just the best, so you should always be picking it up. Alongside that, most of the time, you're going to take TP. So TP obviously is really, really good for the laning phase. It's especially good because you're weak in that first few levels, and the TP can help make up for that. You're a good champ at side laning, so being able to push out side lanes and TP to fights in mid game is really, really nice. And just in general, it's going to be the most consistent overall. There are some you might take other times, so Exhaust can be good against some Assassins, not all of them, 
So some assassins you might actually prefer a TP against if they're kind of a poke assassin, but there are some assassins that, you know, they can't all in you at all if you have exhaust. Um, Ignite, I'd probably only ever take this versus Silas. So again, like you, you're heavy trading and he goes on you first, you can ignite him before he Ws you. But other than that, I don't think it's that worth it. The only other thing you might consider is maybe cleanse. So if you're against something, again, like Annie or Lissandra, you can take cleanse and then not build any tenacity. So you could, you know, I think normally when you play against those champs, you're going like Mercs unflinching, but if you don't want to take those, you can take cleanse. Now, I don't think this should work at a high level because normally you'll get poked out too hard for not having TP. And if your opponent is good, they'll know how to use a TP advantage over you. So I would just recommend taking flash TP and that's pretty much going to work almost every single game. If you really do want to experiment, there are some options available. Now for Azir's abilities, most of the complexity comes from the combos that you can do with them, which we'll talk about in the next section. But I think it's good to have a basic understanding of how the abilities work. So your most important ability and the ability you're going to start with is W. So what this does is you put down a soldier this ability has two charges and it has a ring which is its auto attack radius if there's any target within this radius the soldier is going to auto attack instead of you so for example if i you know place one outside the radius and i order this it'll be you know from me right it's going to be from me but if i have a target that's within the radius it's going to auto attack with the soldier now there's a couple of interesting things to this something you would have seen there it does have pass through damage now it is reduced so if you read through all this basically it's like the ability as a whole, it scales a lot with both level and AP, so it just naturally gets stronger um, as you level up, and of course you'll be putting points in it. You can see there that first line under it, soldiers deal additional damage to enemies that are not Azir's attack target. As you get later in the game, you get higher level, that will be a greater amount. Um, and some other things here that you can read, you know, that they strike the same targets, they deal 25% damage after the first, that's just so if you have multiple targets, or sorry, one target being hit by multiple soldiers, it's not going to just double the damage. Um, it's going to add like a little bit to it and of course sand soldiers do expire twice as fast when near an enemy turret so like if you're harassing someone under the tower they are going to disappear a bit easier but functionally all you really need to know is that you basically will want to to be putting these down to auto attack targets with them um, and they're a really good zoning tool right like if you can set up two in front of you it makes it really difficult for your opponent to get in front of you but we'll talk about more of that in the actual combos and tips section Next is the Q, and all this really does is move your soldiers to an area while also dealing damage. So you can use this Q to direct them to wherever you want within this radius. They can be on you, um, you know, away from you or whatever. And it does work if you have multiple soldiers, of course, it will move them both to the target position. In addition, obviously, like I said, it deals damage and slows them. That can be pretty nice because it's going to allow you to sneak in an auto attack while they're still slowed. Obviously, as you get more attack speed, it gets easier and you might even be able to fit in a couple autos. Um, but that is super, super nice. And you can see there the cooldown does go down pretty significantly as you get points in it which is why we'd be maxing that second. Our E here, it grants you a shield and you dash to one of your sand soldiers. It also deals damage if you hit anyone. Um, and also, a lot of people don't remember this, but if you do hit an enemy champ, you get an extra sand soldier charge. So I'll show you what I mean. So first off, if we just want to E to one of our soldiers, you can see it's got fairly long range. You can E to it like this, which is really, really nice. You can see there, you get a pass through if you go through enemies, but if you go through a champ, it's going to stop you. So let's see if I try and go through this, for example, it's going to stop me here, but it does grant me a second charge of my W, which is really, really nice if you're going for um, a heavy trade. Which, and also it actually does do a fair amount of damage. Like having a shield and damage on the same ability, it's like Victor Q. It's a really strong trading tool, so definitely don't forget about it. But it does have a really, really long cooldown. If you have multiple sand soldiers down, you just do need to be careful where your mouse is. Obviously, it's going to go to the one that your mouse is closer to, as opposed to, you know, just the nearest one. Like, even if I'm closest to this one, I can dash to that one, right? So it's pretty straightforward, but just kind of remember those. And finally, we have the alt. So the alt is really, really important on us here, and there's a lot of combos that involve it. But basically, it's you you build a wall, and it knocks, it knocks people back. Um, it deals a lot of damage, and they do also block the enemy's path. So it functions as terrain. So... Important things to know from this, well, I'll just show you how to use the ability. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You push your targets together like this, and again, it does count as terrain. So the interesting things with this is, first off, it does come from behind you. So for example, you can actually, if you stand here, it will push them because the wall begins from, from behind you there. Um, obviously, there's a lot of combos you can do. You guys have probably all seen the Sharima shuffle. The wall itself can be dashed through, but if your opponents try and dash too early, they will be knocked back. Um, and also, you and your allies obviously can pass through it. 
Lastly, we have Azir's passive, which I left to last because honestly, it's not super important, but sometimes it is really good. So basically, when there are destroyed towers like this, you get this little icon, which you can right click on to summon a turret. Now the turret, it basically functions like a regular turret, like it has health, which scales, as you can see here. Um, and it also does quite a lot of damage, which scales with AP and your level. So it can be really, really useful if you're sieging. And I'd say that's the most important time is like, let's say you're trying to siege with Baron and you're like trying to hit the tier three tower. It can be really good to place the tier to um, behind you that way you kind of have somewhere to retreat from it does also decay over time as you see here and of course it can be destroyed as well so the thing with it is it's cooldown it's not as long as it used to be so you can feel somewhat free with using it but i find the best time to use it are again when you're sieging or if you're pushing a side lane like let's say you're pushing bot and then you're about to leave to go mid it can be good to place a turret bot just so it'll keep the waves pushed and that way you kind of have pressure on that side of the map while you're roaming so again it's not the most important ability i guess other things is you can't target on enemy nexus or inhib towers but you can target it on your own so it can be quite useful for defending sieges as well but i think a lot of the time you will find that if you're losing it can be quite hard to defend them but do keep it in mind and you can be again pretty liberal with this use for what you're wanting to max you're going to want to max w first then q then e and obviously put a point in alt whenever you are able to some interesting things real quick is that previously on azir you used to go w q q which was so that you could just pressure your opponent really hard in the laning phase there's pretty much no point to that now one because putting more points in q early isn't that valuable and also just because you can't really pressure in the very early levels as well as you'd want anyway so what i would pretty much always recommend is where well, you have to start w there's nothing else you can start start w put a point in q then put a point in a and that's going to give you a lot of safety and from then on just continue to max w Zia has a lot of different combos as well as some tips and tricks. So what we'll do is we'll start with the basics and the ones that get used earlier on in the game and we'll kind of move up. So your most basic combo is the WQ combo. So the way you're going to play the lane for the most part is when your opponent comes up to CS, you're going to try and place a W like next to the CS or in front of it or something. And then when they walk up to them, walk up to it, that allows you to auto attack. You can also, you know, let's say you can't quite get close enough to your opponent like because they're too long range or something you can just place a soldier and immediately wq auto them so you can do something like this and that allows you to just fit in all the damage as well as normally it's long enough range that your opponent can't really trade back so those are going to be your basic trading combos just a regular w auto works especially well on champs that are melee and then of course the wq auto on champs that are range now, if you want to get a bit more aggressive in the trade, you can look to do a WEQ. So you guys probably know this already, um, but Q can can be used while you're WEing. So for example, if I just WE, like let's say I go for my max range, I can W all the way, or sorry, I can E all the way to here, right? So I place the soldier here again, and this time I use Q. So you're going to want to use Q in the mid way of using E. So basically while you're on the way, you can Q somewhere else and that will extend it. So if you're really trying to look for some sort of all in or something, it can be really good to try and hit all these abilities you can either do it from you know the max range like if you're really far away like this of course you get the shield the damage the extra charge like everything all of that that's all going to be really good or obviously you know if you're a bit closer you can do it differently like maybe you want to say wq auto and then if they miss their ability perhaps you like go in afterwards or something like that so there's lots of different things you can do there. Um, what else can you do? I mean, you can also use it if your opponent's trading onto you. So like something that's kind of common is that when you play against like a champ like LeBlanc, for example, like she's often going to dash forward. Um, and then remember that E gives you a shield even if you, if you don't pass through anything, right? So like what you can do is you can just use it for like to dodge damage. You can just use it to, um, again, like block your opponent, get the shield and get the W like charge and everything so there's lots of ways you can do that for trading but again the thing you need to be really careful of is just that it is your escape right and another way you might want to use it is it's really really good for getting away from ganks so if you're getting ganked, easy way, just place your W behind you and E towards it. Obviously, that's not the longest range. So if you have more mana, what might be better is to EQ out of there, for example. That can give you more range. And also just realize that as long as you're within your E range, you're you're still going to get there, right? So like if someone's ganking, one thing I see really common on Azir, like let's say you're getting ganked from here. Um, what I often see is they will place a soldier behind them and then walk towards it and then E it. But that's kind of the wrong way to do it. Like what you normally want to do is you place that W behind you, but you actually walk forward because they're going to chase you this way and then you E out, right? And that way you might not even have to use the Q. So just be really, I guess, mindful of that because there's a lot of skill expression with how you can use it.
Another more advanced version of this combo that you can use is you can actually use Q to change direction. So again, let's take the same example that we're getting ganked. Um, let's say that we don't have time to put a W behind us. Like our W is already in the lane. You can E this way and then Q back. So the time I, I just like remember in my mind is there was this clip of Caps dodging a Sejuani ult with this because they were expecting him to dodge back, but he initially went forward and then he was able to dodge like this. So I think this is pretty important for dodging ganks. Um, you can use it obviously for some sort of weird trade. Like um, let's say that you're expecting that if you WEQ into a Syndra that you're for sure gonna get stunned, right? So it might be better to do something like this and that way it's a bit more unpredictable. So there's, yeah, just remember that you can change the directions. Now, when we hit level six, some more combos open up to us. And the most basic one is your gank setup combo with your ult. So a very, very common thing to do on Azir, and you'll see this in competitive all the time, is especially if you're against an opponent with no dash, if they ever walk up in the lane after level six, you can just, you know, EQ, um, ult them from pretty much the other side of the lane. And it's really, really hard to avoid. I mean, it's a ton of gank setup and they will, they will flash this a lot of the time. Now that is really important to note because as I'm not sure if they'll do it so much in low elo, but as you get higher elo, if you ever WEQ onto someone as a Zir, they're going to flash immediately. So you have two choices. You can either WEQ, just take the flash and, and hold your ult, and then you can look to go for it again after. Or you can WEQ flash R. So in the team fights section, I'll probably show you some examples of this. But if, for example, you're expecting your opponent to flash backwards, you can just WEQ and then flash out. And a lot of the time you will catch them like that. Um, again, it's something you probably need to kind of figure out on your own because I can tell you from my experience in high low, though, people almost always flash when you WEQ on them. But in low low, if you're finding that that's not happening, then you might as well just ult them and you probably don't need to flash. It's also just super important in general that you know when your opponents don't have flash on his ear because again, this gank setup combo is disgustingly overpowered. I mean, it's just the range is so long. Um, and if you ever have any sort of gank jungler or gank threat at all, it's, it's going to be a real nightmare for your opponent. As well, just remember that you can, of course, change the direction. So if, for example, you have a W out here, it doesn't mean that you can't ult this guy because all you need to do is you just need to EQR behind them and then drop the ult. So there's a lot of different things you can use uh, for that. And it would be really a good idea, I think, if you come into practice tool and just test them out. Now for some general tips and tricks, I mean, there's some obvious ones, like of course we can dash over walls. Remember as well that your sand soldier does give a bit of vision, so you can use it to check areas. And of course, you can see there, I can dash over the wall. You can use it to W bushes. So if I put an enemy in there and I W it, I will see it. Um, you can also do some fancy stuff with changing like multiple, or sorry, going over multiple walls. Like for example, I can WEQ two walls like this. Um, you can also come back over the walls. So let's say for example, that I was trying to bait someone to follow me. I guess it's like pretty unrealistic, but you can do something like that. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different things you can do. Now, one thing that I think is super important on Azir that I don't think a lot of guys talk about is there is, I don't know if it's a bug or a feature. I think it's a bug, but when your opponents have vision of your sand soldier, they'll see you recalling. And I'll try putting in an example here from one of my solo key games, but it's really, really important that when you're going for a recall that you don't do it while they have vision of your sand soldier because they will get vision of you through the fog of war. Like if I base here, they will see you even if they don't have vision. So it's always good to just back out a bit so that you're out of range of the sand soldier and it fully times out. You can see this like little tether here. As soon as you get up too far out of range, it'll disappear. So just be really, really careful of that as well. Let's take a look then at some of Azir landing phases. So this is Azir versus Syndra, which is a tough matchup. And as you can see, I've gone for the corrupting part, which is to help sustain up. So again, most matchups here, not all of them, you're going to need to play a bit safer early. And what that generally looks like is you want to make sure you're placing your soldiers in a way that they can't just walk past them. So this is something that I see bad Azirs do and even challenger Azirs. They will place their Ws too far out and then it'll just allows your opponent to walk past them, right? And kind of into your range. But what you can do is you can just kind of put your soldiers in a way that you always have something to defend or to kind of something in front of you so that if they try and chase you down, you have like a fallback point. Another thing that I see a lot of Azir's do is sometimes they feel the need to always use soldier auto attacks. There is nothing wrong with using regular auto attacks in the early game. It's actually easier to CS with regular auto attacks um, just because the animation is so much better. And again, a lot of the time you want your soldier kind of in the right position. So this is kind of an example of like what's really scary is you need to make sure that you have um, 
like if you don't have a soldier in front of you you're gonna get traded on right like honestly what i should have done right here i should have placed a w on these two creeps even if i had no intention of using it because i have a second charge almost up um but because i don't have something in front of me syndra is able to just like walk on me and hit me sorry for the artifacting by the way it just happens when i spam on pause i don't know why but anyway Back to the lane. So what am I trying to do? Pre-sex, pretty much. I just want to farm as much as possible. Um, make sure that I don't fall behind. If I get the opportunity to, to harass my opponent, like that's great. But I'm not really playing for it, right? Like, again, I'm just like mainly looking to do this. Now, if you have Scorch um, or if your opponent walks up too far, you know, feel free to like WQ auto them. That can deal quite a lot of damage back. Now, you should be careful sometimes because in some matchups, like Syndra actually is a good example. There's pretty much no chance you're ever going to kill her pre-sex. So there's not much point using WQ aggressively because you're just going to want to save that mana and save those cooldowns defensively. But there are also lots of matchups that you can kill preset if your opponent, you know, doesn't doesn't look to get too aggressive or if they misplay or something like that. You can see here, I have the wave on my side. Again, you would push out if you have the opportunity to, but Syndra is one of the harder matchups for Azir, which is why you can see that I'm playing like relatively defensive and I'm trying to like, you know, again, keep the soldiers in front of me, try and use the soldiers to auto attack from far enough away that Syndra can't look to punish me. So that's kind of your general game plan. And I guess like what is a difficult... Uh, rangers melee matchup now in this one specifically later on you probably want to rush merktrez because that's going to allow you to again dodge all the skill shots and have the tenacity and stuff like that so if we kind of skip forward a bit um I think at some point I start getting some better trades. So obviously as I'm getting stronger, I'm starting to look for WQ trades because like now I'm starting to do a bit more damage. And my I know my opponent is just a bit lower on HP in general. So if I can get like an auto W or sorry, I guess it's like W on the ground and then just an auto Q auto that adds up to a lot of damage as you can see here. Um, but yeah, playing playing pretty defensively. Normally once you get to level six though, there's not that many lanes that you're going to lose post six. And like I'm saying, like, there are some matchups you win pre six too. That's kind of the beauty of Azir. Is like not only does he scale, he's also extremely good in one v one. Has mobility, gank setup, like he just has pretty much everything. So I think that's going to be everything from this example. Next, we'll go on to a different matchup. So this matchup here, Azir versus Tristana, is another somewhat difficult matchup, but you have more options, I guess, against Tristana than you do against Syndra. So you can see here that at level one, if I can, I'm trying to put my soldiers in a way that when she comes up to auto attack, that she's going to take a little bit of damage. As you can see here, I'm just getting little taps on her. And this is especially good because this guy started cull, so I wouldn't recommend that if you're interested in this matchup. But as you can see, I'm getting some trades down, and because I have the sustain advantage with the corrupting pot, I'm able to do this and be fine taking a little bit of creep damage back. Now, of course, I do still need to respect like Tristan is very very strong at level 2 and if I go too far up I'm going to take a lot of damage especially before I have E like once you have E to trade back it's not too bad but you can see here if I'm just willing to walk away kind of just let that bomb fade without dealing tons of damage to me then it's going to be fine and I know that while that's down I can get a bit more aggressive like if she walks up to this creep I can look for something like a, a WQ you know which is kind of what I'm like fishing for here or at least I think I was I probably should have cued her there honestly uh, I think I was playing maybe a bit too passively but like I said, if you're in these sorts of matchups and you survive early, like normally it's going to be fine. And if you do get any additional damage onto her, it's going to be really, really nice. So let's kind of skim forward to after first base. So I got to kill topside, which makes this a lot easier. But after first base, you're really, really strong. Like that's when you want to start being aggressive. By that point, you're probably like level five, level six. Um, and yeah, you just deal a lot more damage at this point. So you can see that I'm like positioned way further up. I'm able to just use the E to disengage from this. I still took a lot of damage because she had Hail of Blades. Um, but again, like most champs, you're going you're gonna to win out those trades. Um, and yeah, like what you can do as well is you can, if you're not comfortable with, I guess, just like keeping the wave on your side, you can just look to kind of match by spamming autos, but just be careful because a lot of the time, if you are far up in the lane, you will get punished pretty heavily for it. Um, but again, I think like you can kind of see here that when I go into the WQ range, I do take a lot of damage back. So a lot of the time it isn't really worth it, um, at least against Tristana. Like again, it's going to be worth it against most champs. These these examples I've used are both matchups that are pretty bad for Azir early. But um, I'll show you now some, some easier matchups and ones that you can play a bit more aggressive in. This matchup here, Azir versus Silas, is very, very easy for Azir. And honestly, you'll find most uh, melee champs to be pretty easy, especially if you have Scorch. You can see here I have Transcendent Scorch, so I opted to drop the mana flow. And that's mainly because I know that Silas 
I don't really need to spam push waves with Silas because he doesn't have much wave clear of his own. But you can see what I'm going to try to do here is I'm just going to make sure that whenever he comes up for CS that he's going to take at least you know one order from my soldier. If I can get two, that's great. And also I'm putting them in positions where if he wants to come up and get the CS, even without me having to place another one, he's still going to take a lot of damage. Now, obviously you need to be careful if you use your soldiers too far forward, you're going to end up you know being vulnerable. But you can see here, right? Like the amount of damage I can get done. I know that he wants this creep, right? So I'm going to go and place W on it. I get the nice W order, follow up with a Q, another order, and he wants that CS too, so he takes another one. How much damage is that? He starts with what, like 540? I think it was about 200 damage all up. Might have even been more. Okay, so he goes from 550, yeah, about 200 damage all up, which is pretty nice, right? Because you're level two and you heavily outscale. So if you're in winning matchups, so either weak range champs or melee champs in general, like this is kind of what you're looking to do. You can see there I'm getting tons and tons of damage and that just allows me to have full control over them. But yeah, we have a skirmish eventually come back. I'm level five or I'm level six now with chapters. So I'm really, really strong. This is a great point in the game as well, because if you are versus a champ that needs to engage on you, even if they do finally manage to connect the chain and get a new, worst case, you can just ult them away. And sometimes they'll be scared to do so because they're scared about getting altered into towers. So that's kind of the point in the lane where you start to get really, really strong. Something else that just kind of goes without saying is that if your jungler is around and you're level six, obviously do look for those, those setup ganks just by doing the WEQR combo just because a lot of the time if they are that far up they're pretty much dead especially if they don't have flash and again if you weren't sure what i meant by that just go back to the combo section and have a look at the ones with the alt now for some azir team fights so team fighting on azir is pretty hard i have to say there's a lot of different things that you can do in team fights and you just have quite a lot of potential so the kind of most important thing as azir and, and kind of the most basic team fight is that just like any other kind of dps mage you stand behind your front line and just try and dps their front line right so it's called front to back team fighting basically you're just trying to keep yourself away from the from the engage you know be behind the tank so you're kept safe and just hit whoever you can right so this is the team fight here that i did not play particularly well but because i was following those kind of i guess those guidelines i still managed to come out on top right so what are the big threats to me in this fight i'd say it's cannon and rel i do manage to stay out of the cannon ult but i do get caught up by the rel ult right so that's a big mistake but at least just note that I have my tanks in front of me, right? So this is a lot different from me. If, say if I was swap places with Scion, that would be really bad because this Kha'Zix would just be hitting me for free. So while it's not perfect, it's, it's playable, right? And then here, what you would normally do is you can just use your ult to self-peel people off you. So if you do get engaged on, it can be a good idea to either, you know, again, ult them away from your carries or sometimes ult them to your carries. Like I could ult someone to Kai'Sa or I could ult them further away. Here I ult and I don't even get the Kha'Zix, right? So the Kha'Zix is another threat that I want to get here. And this guy was Zonyan. So honestly, my ult didn't really do anything, right? But you can see that we still won this fight. Well, one, because it was 5v4, but again, because of those guidelines. So you might be wondering, you know, why did I show this fight? And mainly it's just because I think this fight kind of shows like what you're aiming for and also some of the things that can go wrong with it. So obviously I'll try and show you guys some more fights that go as expected, but I think this is a really good example of just like the common pitfalls as well as like the guidelines that you need to follow. Probably the hardest thing about Azir team fighting is just knowing when you should go for the shuffle because it's a big mistake that a lot of Azir players go for is actually going for the shuffle when they shouldn't because most of the time you can just win a team fight by playing front to back DPS as Azir, right? And the thing is if you go in with a shuffle at the wrong time, you can very easily throw the game. But the kind of key time to look for shuffles are, one, obviously if a lot of cooldowns have been used, it's kind of scary to be the one to go in first because you might just get CC'd up and instantly die. Also, if they happen to be grouped, that's another really good sign. And of course, if health bars are low. So you can kind of see here that, well, all these things have happened. A lot of cooldowns have already been used. The health bars are low. Both the carries, importantly, are grouped up. If I engage on this and I were to ult, you know, this Jackson, I don't even know what champ this is. I think that's a Thresh. If I were to ult these two in, oh, actually it's a Leona. Okay, if I were to ult the Jackson, and Leona in, that's kind of pointless. But if I can catch the Ash and the Ari, that's really good. And in fact, I would still go for this, even if the Jackson Leona weren't here, because the carries are the important part, right? And here, while I knew that the ults were down, I didn't know about their flashes. So what I was going to do is I was just going to WEQ and flash behind. That way I could catch them if they flash. And I believe someone actually did flash. So if we go back and have a look at it again, um, I think it was, Ash, it's either Ash or Ari that flashes here. And if I didn't go for the flash, I wouldn't have caught them. And so even while being relatively behind here, I still managed to have really high impact. So again, it is really hard to, to know, I guess, when the right situation to do it is. And you do kind of just have to get better at it. My guess would be that if you... If you kind of feel like you're going to go in and instantly die, like definitely don't do that. Like it's not worth trading out your life for it. But if you can, you know, scoop up the enemy AD carries and then 
or the enemy carries, I guess, and be in a position where you're still going to be able to safely DPS, or if you just deal so much damage that you instantly win the team fight. That's kind of the, those are kind of the scenarios you're looking for. Here's another example where I'm looking for a shuffle. So you can see that they're sieging the enemy mid tower. Now, what I could do here is I could just DPS from behind my brawn, right? Like I think if you're doing that, there's nothing really wrong with that. But the reason I went for this is because I noticed that they were committing too hard. And especially once cooldowns had been used, I felt really confident to go. So I think once the Nautilus hook especially was gone, I knew that I could just catch the Zeri. And if I caught Zeri, the game was just going to be instantly over. Um, and then off this, we just got the Baron. So I guess it's like... Again, it's hard to give you a one-size-fit-all rule of like, you should shuffle then and, and you shouldn't shuffle here, right? It's hard to do that. But I think, again, like pay attention to cooldowns, how grouped they are. If the AD carry has flash, you know, who actually the important target is. Like here, Zeri had nine kills. So I knew if I get Zeri, I could trade my life for it, right? Like I'm a 0-3 Azir here. If I even one for one with Zeri, it'd probably be worth it. But a lot of the time, if you do kind of wall people off from you, it can be really hard for them to DPS you, right? Like look here, you can see that no one can actually hit me because they can't get around the wall, right? So it's real difficult. Obviously, sometimes in solo queue, things just go really weirdly and you're not going to have a normal fight. So this is a fight here where I at some points needed to go in and at some points, I just needed a DPS. So kind of see here, I checked this bush. There was a sedge. All right, that's one cooldown out of the way. So that's kind of good. We're getting aggressive here. I have my Vi in front of me. So it's pretty easy to DPS, right? But then I noticed that they're caught up over the wall. So I'm going to go for them. Now, the reason I also that way was mainly because I just wanted to have the sedge on the other side of the wall while I dealt with the Yasuo. But it turns out that sedge just comes back over and I was forced to Zonius, right? So this is a really awkward space to DPS. So I have choices here. I could either try and get, you know, behind a tank up here, or I can just go straight on the Twitch, which is kind of what I thought would be better because at the time, I didn't know where Jax was coming from. So if I go up here and I walk into Jax, I'm definitely dead. But I was pretty certain that there'd be no Jax below me. So I decided to commit on the Twitch and now I'm very, very low on health, right? But I still have someone in front of me. I still have this Alawi. So what I'm doing here is I'm really carefully playing on my range, trying to space out the Jax cooldown. And that's just allowing me to kind of like auto and clean up this fight. So even though I'm really low, I'm still looking for those opportunities to auto because a lot of the time, even if you have very little health, as long as they don't actually have the cooldowns or the range or whatever to threaten you, you can realistically play out a team fight on on this hp because it's not so much even about the hp i have here it's just the question of whether i am in range or not so that might have been a bit overwhelming like i said as their team fighting is not easy but the the core things to remember are this i guess two approaches the dps approach or the engage if you're dpsing stand behind your tanks stay out of their range just hit whoever's in front of you if you're engaging you're looking to try and scoop up enemy carries especially adcs those are the most valuable and if they don't have flash they're even more valuable targets and of course if they're grouped as well and you get multiple people that adds an extra layer of reward on top of it so I think the Azir matchups look something like this. I will say I haven't ordered them left to right. This is my kind of just general feeling of which tier they should be in. I also think that a lot of the matchups are very dependent on the junglers. So in general, Azir is kind of weak against very long range poke champs or champs that have really, really strong all ends. So examples of strong all end like Fizz and Aurelia, long range poke champs, you know, your Cinderas, your Luxes, your Nikos. Now, jungle pressure will make all these lanes very difficult because champs like Lux and Cinder are really, really gankable. Same with Annie. But... If you're left alone in the 1v1, they can actually be quite difficult to lane against. And now a lot of the time in competitive, you will actually see Azir picked into some of these difficult champs, like picked into Annie because you outrange her really, really hard in team fights. But she forces you to make a lot of kind of difficult decisions. Like a lot of the time you have to go resolve second and you might have to rush Merc Treads. So it's kind of like, this is more like how it's making you feel for the game. It's not necessarily, um, you know, how difficult or how easy a lane is. It's just kind of my impression of, you know, would I play into this champ sort of thing. Obviously, a lot of the champs and the matchups can be solved in certain ways, right? Like if you play against a Zed and you build the right items, it actually might not be that hard, especially if you don't ever give over a kill. But in general, it's not a champ that I would pick a Zero into, right? Like I'd much rather play Galio or Lissandra or something into that. Um, some of these matchups are a bit lower. Like Zerath, for example, is actually picked often into a Zero, but again, is very gankable. And I think that's you know somewhat dealable with. Um, there are also matchups down here that are actually quite good into Azir. So a champ like Corky, right? It's a free lane. There's no doubt about it. You will destroy Corky in lane. But Corky is actually really good against Azir because he outranges him in the mid game. So it can be quite hard to DPS against a poke champ. And also he's one of the more difficult mid laners to gank because it's quite hard to catch his W um, with your ult unless he holds it too long. So in that sense, it's, yeah, it's a free matchup, but it can provide some difficulty for you in teamfights. I think Vagar is another example of that, of just being... 
you know, again, it's, it's pretty much free. You both get to scale, but the cage can be a really big problem in team fights and sometimes forces you to go Merc Treads. So I guess what I would say overall is that there's not many matchups that Azir actually finds too difficult in the 1v1. You know, there's no very hard matchups. I think almost every matchup is at least playable. And a lot of these, your mileage is really, really going to vary because, um, you know, if you versus Lissandra, pure 1v1, not a problem at all. Lissandra has really good 2v2. If you're fighting against something like Lissandra Jarvan, you're going to have a really difficult difficult time playing Azir. So just the routing of this champ is that in the 1v1, most of the time you're going to win or at least be even, but the junglers can affect it quite a lot. Ultimately, if you get through the early game, you hit one item without being behind, or even if you're if you're ahead, that's really good. You're going to go into mid game and then you're going to, you're just going to, yeah, you're just going to take over completely. So guys, that's going to be it for my full in-depth guide to the rework Azir. Please let me know in the comment section below if you guys did like it or if you have any questions about it, or if I've missed something, because honestly, it was a long video and chances are I probably have missed something. So make sure to let me know uh go check out my twitch some of the socials you see on your screen here are outdated but just check out my twitch that's the one i care about mainly and if you did like the video go ahead and like and subscribe and i'll see you guys next time